Good morning. Today I want to discuss the EKF slam. So we want to tackle the problem of estimating the location of a platform as well as the map of the environment in an online approach and we want to use for that the extended Kalman filter. So we want to solve the simultaneous localization mapping problem um, using a Kalman filter and seeing how we can actually do this. So this was kind of the first approach to SLAM which was out there developed in the late 80s um, trying to use the tools from Gaussian recursive state estimation in order to solve the simultaneous localization mapping problem. Again, as we have discussed before, localization means building a map of the environment with a mobile sensor platform and at the same time localize the platform within the map built so far. And if you do this together, we refer to this as a SLAM. You can do this in an online or offline fashion, so online SLAM or full SLAM. And we will be looking into online SLAM here and look into, again, how to solve that with the recursive base filter, namely the extended comment filter. That is relevant for a large number of different applications, ranging from indoor application through navigation in urban environments with uh, autonomous cars to undersea or underwater robotics, um, underground exploration or space exploration, and a lot of systems for um, which perform simultaneous localization and mapping on those more intelligent platforms use an extended Kalman filter or an information filter, which is a variant of the Kalman filter, or also a lot of approaches working in undersea use um, a Kalman filter-based approach. Um, Kalman filter-based approaches are not very popular today anymore for solving the SLAM problem because they have some disadvantages, disadvantages, especially with respect to computational complexity, but they are still often used for um, if you only have a short-term map of the environment, for example, for performing, um, for, for building a map only from the last few hundred time steps and localize within this map in terms of visual odometry. And it's one of the first approaches to SLAM and therefore it bursts understanding it, diving it deeper, deeper, but also then understanding the limitations of those approaches and see how other approaches may be beneficiary um, overcoming those limitations. In terms of what we want to solve in SLAM, we assume to have our control commands available. So how was the platform moving through the environment based on controls, such as go meter per second forward, rotate by 30 degrees, things like this are controls. And we have our observations. This can be, uh, can be a laser scanner observing the environment, can be a camera, um, then your, the models for your observations will look different. We are looking here, just assuming a range bearing sensor, so some sensor that tells me something about in, in which direction is an object and how far it is away. So it could be a stereo camera, um, or could, but could also be a laser range scanner where you extract that information from your sensor data. If you want to have the map of the environment and the trajectory of my platform, so the pass, so the map of the environment M could be um, a set of 3D points, for example, of those landmark locations, or in the past could be X, Y, Z, your pitch roll, just as an example. And we want to use a recursive based filter, especially the extended common filter, in order to solve this. So we are interested in the online SLAM problem. That means we don't want to estimate the full trajectory, only the last post, the map of the environment, and given the um, observations and my control commands. And the Kalman filter is a state estimation system assuming the linear Gaussian world. So assume all my models are linear, all my uncertainties are Gaussian, and then it's an optimal estimator actually providing you with an equivalent solution to a least squares approach. In reality, however, we don't live in a linear world, we're living in a non-linear world. Therefore, we need to linearize, um, and that's actually what the extended Kalman filter then is doing, but still assuming um, Gaussian noise and Gaussian uncertainties in here. So in terms of our graphical model, so we have this graphical model over here. We always want to estimate the current location where we are and, and the map of the environment, and we are not interested in the past observations anymore. That means we are marginalizing them out. We are forgetting about where we have been before. Of course, we can just store the information on disk, but we are not updating our estimates anymore. So this can, for example, be relevant if you drive through the environment and at some point in time come back to a previously known location, something that we refer to as a loop closure, then the, the loop closure will actually reduce the uncertainty also of all past poses where you have been before. But that's something that the common filter 
is ignoring because it says, I don't care that I need to can update where I was in the past. I'm only interested where I am right now. I forget about the past locations. And therefore, um, the system, the EKF, would not update the previous poses because it's it removed them from its state vector, although it could. Um, and this is something that is uh, typically an open for online SLAM systems because they are only interested in where I am right now because this impacts the decisions that a mo mobile robot does. It may impact the navigation decision where you are, but it doesn't impact where you have been 10 minutes ago. And therefore, that's something that is typically ignored. Okay, so we want to implement this using an extended comment filter. So let's start, look into the extended comment filter formulation. Um, again, this is one iteration of the extended comment filter. So we put in the estimate where we have been before in terms of a mean estimate and a covariance matrix. This is uh, are those two quantities, as well as the new control command and the new observation. And what we want to have, we want to estimate, we want to update the uh, mean and the covariance matrix um, so that the index advances from t minus 1 to t. It has two parts. One thing which is takes into account the motion, which is called the prediction step, those two lines over here, Estim updating the um, belief into the so-called predicted belief. We predict how the belief looks like given our control commands, not taking into account the observations yet. This is a prediction that I'm doing. And then this three lines down here are the correction step. So correcting potential mistakes that we have done in our prediction based on our observations. Here, taking into account my observation. And what we are doing here, basically, we are computing a weighted sum um, down here, uh, using the Kalman gain, weighing the prediction as well as the correction. So this is the prediction, and this is the update of the correction, and the Kalman gain basically tells how strong will that update be if we take into account our observations, and then we are updating my the covariance matrix over here. So what we need to do now, and what we'll do in the next hour, basically, we go through those five lines of code and explain how to realize this in order to build an EKF based SLAM system. So how does it work? The first thing we need to do, we need to specify how does our state vector actually looks like, right? So of course there are models in there that we need to fill such as my uh, motion transition model and my observation function um, but and, and the gradients involved in this. But the first thing we need to do, we need to specify our state vector. What do we want to estimate? And this is basically the dimensionality here of my mean. So let's assume for now we're living in a 2D world, so we're living on a plane. So the only thing we're estimating is the XY location of the platform and its heading, the yaw angle in the plane. We are not taking 3D into account, but the same would actually transport to 3D, but the math is a little bit easier in 2D, therefore we stick with 2D. Um, so that means the position of my platform should be a three-dimensional vector, an X location, a Y location, and an angle, it's called theta, that encodes the orientation of the platform on the 2D plane. But the state vector also contains about, in, takes into account the landmark location. So where are the, the landmarks that I'm actually observing? And the landmarks are point in the world. And if we are living here in a two-dimensional world, this is an X and a Y coordinate for every landmark. So the state vector has basically three dimensions for the pose, three dimensions for the pose, and then two dimensions for every landmark that I'm seeing. So if I have 100 landmarks, this would be 3 plus 2 times 100. So a 203 dimensional state vector that I wanted to estimate. Okay, so the state vector for EKF slam looks like this. We have our robot's pose, x, y, theta, landmark 1, x location, y location, landmark n, x location, y location. And this vector basically grows with the number of landmarks that we are actually seeing. And again, for now, to make our life easy, we assume non correspondence That means this index, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, until n, is something which is known. And if I get an observation, I know which landmark, which index does this observation correspond to in my map or in my state vector, where this is basically the map and this is the pose estimate that I want to do. So this again, assumes known data cessation over here. If you don't know the data cessation, we need to estimate it, for example, through a nearest neighbor approach or some distance in my space of feature descriptions, um, but then um, that gets a bit more tricky. But what most of the approaches do, they just guess a data cessation and stick with this data cessation. Um, because if you want to do uh, take into account multiple data cessations simultaneously, it gets very complicated. And therefore, most of the approaches stick or assume known data cessation have a strategy 
to pick it and then don't take the uncertainty in the data associations into account anymore. Okay, we can also visualize this graphically. So this our mean vector has this kind of xt over here and then the landmarks from landmark 1 to landmark n and the corresponding covariance matrices. So this is the uncertainty about the pose. This is the uncertainty about my landmark locations and this kind of links the, um, links the uh, landmark locations with the position of our platform. Or we can even write it more compactly. We also use this notation pose map and the corresponding uncertainties involved in this. Okay, so now we have defined our state representation. The next thing we need to do, we need to actually cycle through our um, extended carbon filter and um, explain the individual steps, how this vector that we have now ha defined will get updated over time. So the carbon filter has uh, several steps. It has basically the state prediction, it predicts a measurement, it takes a real measurement, it does this data station and then performs the update. So it's uh, slightly more advanced in steps. Uh, so the prediction step and the update step. But of course, in the prediction step, you make a computer predicted measurement um, and you make the data association and um, per then perform the update. So it's slightly more expanded the steps because now we can visualize the steps and can also see what gets updated in this belief. So let's look how we can visualize what's going on here. So what you see here is basically a scene the current state, what's going on. And what you see down here is your uh, state vector and your covariance matrix. And we we'll want to always um, indicate what will be updated. So if we um, move through the environment, we perform a prediction step. So we advance the platform without taking any observation. Um, so we have this platform and we move it forward. That means the uncertainty of our motion um, of our platform location um, increases, so we will be more uncertain where we are um, with respect to our um, pose estimate, because by moving through the environment, we increase our uncertainty about the platform's pose. So if we move forward, we kind of increase the uncertainty about our position. So what will get updated in the state vector is the landmark locations, uh, the, sorry, the robot location will be updated, but the landmark locations will not be updated because just by moving, I'm not changing the position of my landmarks. In the um, covariance matrix, all those entries get updated. Of course, the uncertainty about my platform location increases. This is this um, red ellipse shown over here. It increased from here to there, so this gets updated. But also the correlation, so the links between the platform location and um, the, the landmark locations gets updated because it basically means um, now the pose provides me less information about my landmarks because I'm, I got more uncertain about my pose. So it conveys a smaller amount of information for about the uncertainty of my landmark locations. Then what we're doing, we need to perform a predicted measurement. We need to predict what we see. And the only thing we need to do, we don't need to change anything in here. The only thing we, we basically need to look up is where we are right now and where is the landmark. Um, and then we can compute our predicted measurement. But no updates in those quantities are actually performed. Then I'm actually taking my real observation. So the sensor reports to me, okay, landmark is here. So um, this is basically landmarks that I'm actually seeing. Of course, no update has been done. And then I need to compute the discrepancy between what I actually observed and what I was expecting to observe. So between my actual observation Z and my predicted observation H of X, which is basically the mapping from the state space into the space of observations. And basically have this discrepancy over here between those two. And then based on this, the update step is performed. And in the update step, we can see an update of all the quantities. So the robots will get more certain and will get corrected. The landmark locations will get corrected and also the uncertainty changes. So this is kind of the more expensive update in the sense that all entries in that matrix may get updated. So it's a quadratic number of entries and they potentially need to be or will get updated in my update step. Okay, so let's make a more concrete example and then this abstracted example, and then really go through every step of the extended common filter and explain how it looks like, how do the models look like, and how we can perform the state estimation so that you in the end can actually sit down and implement an EKF baseline system on your own. So that's my goal for the lecture of today. Okay, so the setup, what we're assuming to have. We assume, as I said before, we have a platform that moves on the 2D plane, so we have an X, Y coordinate and um, orientation. 
we assume to have a velocity-based motion model. That means we have um, a translation velocity and a rotational velocity that controls how the platform moves. So basically, I can say the, the, the speed of the rotation and the speed of the um, translation. So something that um, we have this is a rather simple or general model that can be used on a lot of platforms. Um, we assume to have point landmarks in the environment, so individual points that we can observe. Um, that could be, let's say, corners, if you move through the environment, could be door frames, whatever it is, but we assume to have basically point landmarks. So not lines or large extended objects, we just measure points. This is our assumption here. And we assume to have a range bearing sensor, so something which tells us um, whatever, 30 degrees to the right and 5 meters away, there is that point that you want to observe. That's basically what our sensor tells me. Note that this is not a monocular camera because the monocular camera would provide, you, would provide you bearing information but not range information, right? The camera doesn't tell you how far the object is away. But if you have a stereo camera where you know the baseline, then this would quantify, qualify as a range bearing sensor that we could use over here. Um, we assume to have known data associations, so whatever we see, we know what index this uh, landmark is in the map, and we assume to have a known number of landmarks. So the known number of landmarks is not really a constraint, it's just um, otherwise we will need to check, make a lot of checks in the algorithm. Uh, is our state vector already uh, full? Do we need to extend it and do some bookkeepings, which can be painful to implement, uh, but I, I believe it will drag away your attention from the actual things which are important to the Kalman filter itself, and just saying, we assume there are 100 landmarks and we just <coughs> deal with 100 landmarks, for example, is some something that is perfectly fine to be assumed over here. So we assume to know we know the maximum number of landmarks so we can initialize our state vector and our covariance matrix um, accordingly. Which brings me to the first step we need to do. We need to start with an initial belief. We need to initialize our platform. So how do we initialize our system? Um, that can be easily done. Um, if everything is completely unknown, um, we only say where we start, we define our coordinate system. So it basically means I define everything up to start where I started. Um, so I say I start in 0, 0, 0, x0, y0, uh, theta equals 0. And um, I have zero uncertainty in this because I, that's the way I define my coordinate system. But well, all the other landmarks, I don't know anything because I haven't seen anything. Um, so I can initialize them all with 0, but give them an infinite uncertainty over here. Right? This is kind of the easiest initialization that I can do from the state estimation point of view. Um, if you have an idea or reference to an external frame where you know, okay, the robot starts at a different location, of course, you can then change those three numbers and put um, your, the information about where you start in there. Um, these infinity values over here, um, this is, may see this more from a conceptual point of view. In practice, you probably wouldn't do infinity in here because this always leads to numerical issues, but you basically want to have a bookkeeping in some way which landmarks had to be initialized because later on we see if you have an infinite uncertainty here or we have never seen a landmark before there's a smarter way for initializing a landmark than just putting uncertainty in here and assuming um, zeros for the poses so it sees this more as a kind of conceptual initialization than what you would actually do in your implementation so you can put it whatever to not a number and whenever it's not a number you know it hasn't been initialized you need to initialize it on your own that would be probably the right way to do that or you have a bookkeeping which tells you how many landmarks you have seen and initialized and then increasing this count until you reach the maximum number of landmarks. That's the other alternative. And then only use the state vector or and the covariance matrix up to this index of already seen landmarks. Okay, we will now go through the extended common filter, really line by line. The arrow always tells me where we are and we say, okay, how to do this step? What needs to be done in here? Done. We know how it works. Let's go to the next step. And we will iterate over those steps over here and then do our computations. Some of the things to the end gets easy if all the, comp if all the quantities are actually computed. So if I define how G, the G looks like, how the Jacobian looks like, how H looks like over here, how the Jacobian looks like, then everything becomes automatically and easy. Um, but I actually need to provide those quantities and they are kind of the, me the user defined thing that you need to put into your system. So in the first step, we need to know how does this function g look like. So the function g was my prediction step, integrating the motion of my platform. Basically, taking this ut in order to ad advance those two quantities into the predicted belief. And that's what exactly going to happen. So we need to specify how a platform moves through the environment. 
how does the platform move through the environment? It can be easily done. I can say, okay, I know I'm right now at x, y, theta and x prime, y prime, theta prime should be my new pose after I executed my motion command. And then this is an additive term. So this is my way, I, where I start where I am right now and then make an update to that. And the update just comes from a rotation velocity and a translation velocity. So, and these are the standard update motion equations for a differential drive robot, um, which basically tells you if you set a translation velocity and a rotation velocity, where you will end up. And these are basically movements on a circular arc that tells you where you're going to end up if you drive on that circular arc. Um, this is now the equation here put in for uh, uh, rotation velocity unequal to zero, otherwise this ratio wouldn't be defined. If you just go straight forward, then this even becomes easier. You just have one sign, one cosine operation in there, and then you know where your update is because you're moving on a straight line and not changing your orientation. But if you change your orientation, um, then it becomes slightly more compli complicated, but it's still a very simple trigonometric, trigonometric function uh, or operation using trigonometric function, which tells you where you are going to end up in the next point in time. And this motion step just only changes the three dimensions where about the pose of the platform, so where the system is, my x, y, and theta coordinate. Which makes sense because when you move through the environment, you're not changing the landmark locations. But um, we need to update our state vector, which is 2n plus 3 dimensional and not just 3 dimensional. So how do we actually map that into our state vector? So in practice, we would only update the three, first three dimensions so we can actually manually compute this. So this is an update for the first dimension, for the second dimension, and for the third dimension. But um, for writing things down, it's sometimes easier to actually write this in matrix form and basically introduce a mapping function which maps the three-dimensional update into a three plus a two n-dimensional update. And this can be easily done by a function which we call fx, in this case transposed, which is a function which has um, here two, um, uh, two n plus three dimensions and here uh, three dimensions um, we, where there is a three by three diagonal matrix with ones on the main diagonal here and all the other quantities are zero. That basically means if, I'm, if I multiply um, these, this update over here to this matrix um, and transpose this matrix, multiply this, it will actually take that, map those things with the identity matrix into the first three dimensions and then add zeros everywhere else. That means the update only affects the first three dimensions and all the other dimensions will end up having zero. So it's kind of a slightly more complicated form um, so that we can actually put our full state vectors over here and then have this mapping which basically tells, yeah, just update the first three dimensions and the rest is not updated. So it's, an, it's a very easy step. So with this standard motion model, taking into account a velocity command, a uh, translation velocity and a rotation velocity, we described how the system would evolve from time t minus one to t. So we have a new idea where we are for our mean estimate, right? Because it's basically we are standing here, we're going with a meter per second forward. That means our new mean has shifted by a meter. And if we rotate it, we may have a rotation in our movement. And that's the only thing which has actually happened here. And I've described how to update that state vector. So the first thing is done. So we know how to update our state vector. Right? That was easy. The next thing we need to do, we need to update our covariance matrix. And to update our covariance matrix, we need to know our previous covariance matrix. We need to know the uncertainty of the motion. This is R, this is basically how, how uncertain is my motion. And we had those G functions over here. And those Gs were the Jacobians of my small G, so of my update function, the function that I just used. And again, this function G, uh, the small g only affects the locations of the platform. It doesn't affect the landmarks, right? So there's no update of the landmarks. And so the only thing I need to compute in order to compute this function g um, is that I have the Jacobian of the affecting the robot's pose, which need to be taken into account. So a three by three matrix over here, because um, this is my, the, the, my, my update, but down here I have a 2n by, by 2n um, identity matrix because nothing has changed, right? So it's a, it's a direct mapping, I've just kind of reused what you had before, so no update on this function um, it needs to be done. There's no nonlinear part in here. I'm just copying over the uncertainties of my landmarks. I'm only affecting 
the, um, the Jacobian here of the, of the pose. And as we see through the operation, we will then get an update in all the quantities that need to be updated in our matrix. Okay, so we can look into how to compute this um, three-dimensional, this Jacobian, uh, which is a three by three matrix Y3, because it basically, I take my function and derive it uh, with respect to the um, change in parameters that I have. So I take my, my function G and derive it with respect to X, with respect to Y, and with respect to theta. So I'm computing the first derivative with respect to X, Y, theta of this update function that I had before. So it's a Jacobian of my motion model. Okay, so how does that actually look like? I have my quantities over here and now want to take this, I just need to sit down and actually compute my Jacobian over here. So what do I need to do? I say, okay, compute the Jacobian of this function x, y, that with respect to x, y, that, which is easy, which gives me um, the identity matrix for this part over here. And then the second part is computing the derivative of x, y, that based on those quantities over here, right? So that's what I would now need to do. So this boils down to deriving this with respect to x, this with respect to y, and this the rest one with respect to theta. And by just computing those first derivatives, with respect to x, y, and theta, I can see that there is no x actually popping up in here. There is no y popping up in here. There's only theta popping up here. So as a result of that, the only nonlinear component which I actually get in here is my orientation. The orientation is the part of my, of my update which has the, is involved in this nonlinear function over here. So the sine and co cosine function depend on the variable theta and not on other variables. As a result of this, the first derivative of those elements with respect to x and y will just lead to zeros and with respect to theta will lead to this update over here. So basically the sine turns into a cosine function, the um, cosine function will turn into a minus sine function over here and those constants, those, those prefactors are, are unchanged and this element also doesn't occur and theta also turns into zero. So only have these two elements over here. So my, up, my, my function derived with respect to um, theta um, in, the, in, in two components will be non-zero. So these are kind of the non-linear elements that I have in here. So if I combine this matrix with the identity matrix, I actually get the matrix which has one on the main diagonal and the two uh, kind of more complex expressions over here, which actually shows you that you are um, that you have these nonlinear components in there, otherwise you would have just the diagonal matrix. And so this is my G X T. So this is kind of the three by three blocks in this large matrix. But we know already the rest of this matrix was just my identity matrix because I don't want to change any of my landmark locations just based on this Jacobian. So I can just use this Jacobian. And so this matrix over here turns into this matrix which I just computed which is, has ones on all the diagonals and just kind of two elements in here, which are non-zero elements. So I take this matrix, multiply it with my covariance matrix and the um, Jacobian transpose plus my R. And again, my matrix R tells me which uncertainty do I add based on the motion. And this is basically the added uncertainty um, through the X, Y, Z coordinate of my, um, of my, of my road platform. So this matrix R, Will, have, will only affect the, this block over here, the three by three matrix block, and increase the uncertainty because it doesn't change any uncertainty of the landmark. So just by moving through the environment, I'm not changing the uncertainty about my landmarks, only the uncertainty about my post. And these are the two elements that we see in here, which are the off diagonal um, elements. So this is basically the impact of the uncertainty update on my landmark po uh, on, of the robot's pose on the uncertainty of the landmarks, so the correlations between pose and landmarks, they also get updated. And these were kind of the, the first row and basically the first column of the uh, or block row, block column of my covariance matrix, which gets updated. This part is not updated at all. It will stay the same. So this part I can fully copy over. So the majority of elements, this basically 2n by 2n dimensional elements of this, can be copied over and are not updated at all. Okay? so.
Now I can just multiply those matrices with each other and I'm basically done. Nothing needs to be added to this. So this step is now also done. That means at this point in time we have performed our prediction step. So let's look how that would look like into, in, in some pseudocode, just executing those two steps over here. So if you would specify the EKF slam, let's say the prediction step, the first thing we would need to do is we specify this matrix F, which performs this mapping uh, from this three-dimensional space into this um, into this uh, three plus two n-dimensional space. If we transpose the matrix F and multiply it with um, with a three-dimensional vector, it will actually take the three-dimensional vector and move it up into this um, three plus two n-dimensional space. And this exactly happens here for the for the mean update. We say our predicted mean is our previous mean plus this F transposed and the update that I'm performing based on my motion model G. And just kind of a copy paste from the previous slide. The only thing, the previous location X, um, uh, the previous location here is, in, which was uh, theta is now the mean of the, the input mean. So from this mean, I'm taking my orientation. So the orientation, the best estimate of the orientation that I have and perform this update. So this is kind of the first line of the EKM, EKF algorithm. Then I built my Jacobian G is the identity matrix plus this small, basically these two elements here, which are mapped um, into the two off diagonal elements, which are non-zero in this Jacobian. And then I perform this update. And again, if I specify R um, only in this X, Y, it's theta space, and I also kind of need to make that mapping up to this um, higher dimensional space. Um, or otherwise I can specify RT directly as a high dimensional matrix where everything is zero except the first three by three block, which is non-zero. And so this is basically a pseudocode implementation that you would need to write down in order to perform the prediction step of the Kalman filter. And so with this, we are completely done. We can just apply it and here we go. Everything is done. We know how to perform the prediction step um, in our Kalman filter and estimate where the system will be after executing the control command and the next thing we now need to do is to take the correction step into account. So for the, for the correction step, we need to compute the Kalman gain. And the only quantity we don't know, so this is this guy we know, this basically specifies how certain I'm in about my observation. So it's a user-defined quantity. The only thing which is interesting here is this h. And this h is the Jacobian of my observation function, which computes me my predicted observation. So this function small h. So capital H is the Jacobian. So what I need to do now, I need to look into my observation function. How do I compute a predicted observation? Take that function, derive that function in order to get my Jacobian over here. Okay, so let's go and see how that works. Looking into the correction step. Again, in the correction step, just as a reminder, we assume we have known data association. That means nothing else that I know for every observation I can um, basically know to which have a correspondence matrix C, which tells me which landmark I should index in order to, um, to map that observation to the landmark in my state vector. So basically the mapping from, if I see that landmark in my image, I know it is dimension whatever, 153, um, where my landmark is stored. So this is basically done with this index. Um, we initialize all landmarks as unobserved, so we have a way for saying all oh, this landmark has been um, observed, yes or no, because if it hasn't been observed, I kind of want to, want to initialize it in a kind of smart way using uh, my observation. And then I need to compute my uh, function h, or specify my function h, and I need to compute its Jacobian, and then can compute my Kalman gain and perform the remaining updates um, in the correction step of my Kalman filter. So range bearing observation, how does that work? So range bearing observation is a two-dimensional quantity which gives me a range and a bearing. So I say, okay, that point is three meters away and 30 degrees to my right-hand side, for example. That would be an observation that I get here. Three meters away, 30 degrees to my right-hand side. Or 10 meters away, one degree to my left-hand side. These are examples for range bearing observations. And I know the point that I'm seeing, again, I have no data association, I know to which index this corresponds to in my state vector. So if I have a landmark has never been seen, I can actually initialize a landmark. And the best estimate I can have if I have, if I don't know anything before, I can say, okay, I just assume I take my pose where I am right now, so my predicted pose. So the best thing I can do is my best prediction of what I have right now. There's the uncertainty of my platform, uncertainty of my platform. And then I take the relative measurement into account. Basically takes, okay, what's the update in X and Y is basically how far is the point away 
and that the cosine and the sine of the orientation of my platform and my measurement. So it's like I'm standing here, I'm looking into this direction. So this is this quantity over here and this quantity. And then I say, um, okay, and then the point is five meters away and 30 degrees to my right-hand side. So this would be the 30 degrees to my right-hand side, this would be the five meters. And then this function with the cosine tells me what, how do I need to update my x-coordinate and my y-coordinate in order to um, get the position of the point. And this would be the kind of predicted location of that landmark, um, of that landmark j where it should be. So if I have no information about the landmark, the best thing I can do is just take my observation to initialize the landmark. And then um, this landmark, this has an uncertainty, um, the position of that landmark, which is basically the uncertainty that I had about my pose and the uncertainty of my uh, observation in a combined fashion. Right? So I can I have a direct way for initializing the landmark and don't need to put this infinite uncertainty and zero, zero, zeros everywhere, which is numerically not the best thing to do. So you would initialize the landmark in that way. And then what I need to do is I need to, and if the landmark has, and then I'm basically done with this step. And otherwise I need to compute, if I, if I know where the landmark is, I have seen it already, I have already an estimate, I need to estimate what I'm going to see, right? I need to compute my predicted observation. So I need to predict a range and I have to predict a bearing um, from that observation given that I've, I know where that landmark is. Okay, um, so if I know, so if I know where my landmark is, um, then I have an estimate of my landmark. So I have an estimated x location, an estimated y location of my landmark. And then I can say, okay, how far, so what should I observe? So I know where I am, or I have an estimate of where I am, and I have an estimate where the landmark is. So basically the Euclidean distance tells me something about the range. So how can I compute it? I compute the vector of the differences in x and the y coordinates. So this is basically delta x and delta y between my location and the landmark location, which I can compute over here. And then um, I have a q, which is delta transpose delta, which is basically the square distance that I want to observe, right? It's the, you, the, the, squ the square distance, so if I take the square root of Q, um, this is my Euclidean distance, just expressed here in, uh, in form of vectors. So I have this two-dimensional vector, the, the difference in X between the landmark and the robot, the, delta, the difference in Y between the robot and landmark, and if I square that um, and take the square root then later on out of that over here, it is my expected observation. So I take this Q, square root of Q is the distance between um, the position of the robot and the position of the landmark given the current estimate, and that's what I'm predicting to observe. Based on what I know, that's what I should get. And for the orientation, I basically need to take into account again this delta x, delta y, and um, so in order to compute the, the angle, and then also need to subtract on here where the robot is looking to, because depending on where the robot is, if the landmark is over there, I will of course linearly update the, um, the angle of angular part, and um, so it's two components, the a ton two, uh, which gives me the, um, the orientational offset in the, uh, based on the difference between in the x and the y coordinate of the landmark and the robot and the location of the landmark itself. And this is then gives me my function h. So my observation function, the function which computes my predicted observation is this h, which is a function that takes the um, mean vector as an input and gives me a two-dimensional output. The first one is the square root of q and the second one is a ton two of this difference minus the um, best estimate that I have about where the robot is right now in terms of its orientation. And that's it. Again, you can see there's a nonlinear function. So this is nonlinear and this is nonlinear. So this needs to be appropriately taken into account. I specified h. Now the next thing is how to compute the Jacobian for, of this h because I needed the Jacobian of this function um, to be uh, taken into account in my, for computing the Kalman gain. So what I need to do is I need to take this function and compute the Jacobian. So what are the quantities which, are, which matter over here? So the quantities which I need to derive it is basically with respect to the x location, the y location and the orientation of the platform and with respect to the x and y location of my landmark. So for the Jacobian, I basically have five quantities which are interesting for me, which are non-zero over here. Okay, so I, I still use those quantities delta uh, q uh, to compute my z. So this is my, was my function, my function h. Um, now I compute the uh, first derivative, so uh, the, the Jacobian, which is uh, all the partial derivative of this function, so of this function and of this function, with respect to my mean vector, but I'm not interested in the whole mean vector, only five dimensions, five dimensions matter, which are non-zero, which is x, y, theta of the platform and x and y of the landmarks that I'm observing. 
right? Because these are only the ones who which matter. And this is how I, what I compute this kind of low dimensional. If I write low here, it's this low dimensional five dimensional Jacobian because the rest of the entries don't matter and I will take this F matrix again in order to map it to this higher dimensional space. But what I want to need to do now, I need to take those functions and derive them with respect to x, y, theta, m, j, x, m, j, y. The same for those two. What I will do now is I um, will sit down and make those derivations. So, first uh, component of the function is this one derived with respect to x, this function derived with respect to y, this function derived with respect to theta, and so on and so forth. And then take the second row, this one derived with respect to x, this one derived with respect to y, and so on and so forth. So, those are the derivatives that I now need to compute manually. Here I will just do it as an example for just one of those and you can do it on your own for the other dimensions. So we'll just take this first partial derivative here, the first component and compute it by hand. How does it actually look like? So I need to take this function over here, square root of q and derive it with respect to x. So I have the d square root of q with respect to the x. And of course in this function q, this is this delta delta transpose, but inside delta there is the x because the x sits in here. So the location of the robot, so this component is the component where, where the x, this is basically this x over here. So I need to apply the chain rule a few times in order to compute the first derivative. So square root of q is basically q to the power of 0.5. So if I compute the first derivative of a function x to the power of 0.5, it is 0 0.5 times 1 divided by the square root of that function. So it's 0 0.5 times 1 divided by the square root of this function because this is q to the power of minus 0 0.5. Right? So this is kind of the, the, the derivative of this, uh, of this outer function. Now I need to go to the inside and I basically have a, a squared function over here. So this is basically x squared. So the first derivative of x squared with respect to x is 2 times x. So I get 2 times my delta x over here and then I need to go inside the delta uh, to this and say, okay, what's the first derivative of this expression with respect to this variable? This is a constant, there's a minus, a minus one times this variable, the variable goes away, just the minus one remains. So I have the minus one over here. So as a result of this, the first derivative uh, or the derivative of this first component with respect to x is one divided by q minus square root of q times delta x. Maybe not the most beautiful form, but we know all quantities, we know, we know uh, delta x, this is just the squared distance, this is uh, the, the Euclidean distance, this is the squared distance, this is a minus one, all the quantities we can easily compute. So nothing tricky in here. And now we can repeat this process and do this for the other dimension and also for the other function. And if we repeat this, we get this as a result. So the results over here, the one divided by q pops up everywhere and then all the individual elements of this, um, of this Jacobian are rather straightforward, either q's, deltas or a square root of those elements. And that's quite easy to compute and gives me the first derivative of my observation function um, with respect to the five parameters which matter. Um, so the, uh, it basically tells me how a change in the robot location or a change in the landmark location um, would be actually uh, mapped to. So it's, it describes this mapping. It's still, again, I am still do, did this in my low dimensional sp uh, space. So the, my Jacobian here has um, two, uh, two rows and five columns, although in theory it should have um, three plus two n columns, but we were only interested in one n. So the other um, n minus one uh, landmarks simply were not relevant for us and the three, location, three dimensions of the robot state space. So I can define now again my, uh, a function um, f very similar to before, uh, which is basically has its a one, uh, um, an identity three by three identity matrix over here because the first three dimensions are the robot's pose are just mapped to the corresponding locations. And then again, everything is filled with zeros except two columns. Two columns need to be special. The two columns, that are those two over here, need to have one in here. So remember, this was the um, fourth and fifth dimension here of my low dimensional Jacobian, those elements over here, where those um, respect uh, the, the first derivatives with respect to my J's landmark. So I need to put in J minus one 
times two zeros, because these were all the landmarks up from landmark one to landmark j minus one. Nothing happens there, all zeros. Then for the landmark j, you need to put a one, one over here, because those quantities need to be mapped to the corresponding uh, part of the, of the update where we are updated my observation. And then from j plus one to uh, n, everything is filled with zeros because all other landmarks don't matter at all. And with this, I actually get my high dimensional Jacobian defined in the original space. And so with this, actually everything is done, right? So Q is user defined, H I just computed. This is the covariance matrix I computed before, given, given, given. So I only need to take this expression, invert it, and multiply it with those two elements, and then I get K. Done, perfect. But also down here, H, I just know how to compute it. We just specified it before. That is the observation that I have. Just need to compute the difference. Multiply it with k, which I just computed, and add it to a vector. Oh, perfect. All done. And now here, this quantity I know. This was my predicted uncertainty. This is my Jacobian, which I computed. This is a Kalman k, which I just computed. This is an identity matrix. Perfect. I can just compute it. So I'm actually done with my algorithm. I just need to perform those steps, and execute those steps, and I'm completely done with my EKF algorithm and realized EKF slam. Again, let's look into the pseudo code. So I expand this a little bit more as we did for the pre um, prediction step, now for the um, correction step. So the first thing I need to do, I need to, un to specify the uncertainty that I have for my observation. So I have an uncertainty in the range and an uncertainty in my bearings. This basically comes from the specification of my sensor. And then I iterate over all observed features. So I'm basically iterating over landmarks. I have my data association, which I assume, for example, doing a nearest neighbor data association, wherever it comes from. And then I need to have my, have my if then else statement. Did I ever observe the landmark J? Again, if I, don't ha if I haven't never observed it, I should actually compute my, um, I can initialize it directly and then I'm done. And then otherwise I compute my predicted observation. Um, so I can actually also compute the predicted observation, but um, and, and do the same steps. Um, it's not really needed here because um, I already initialized the landmark, but I can actually use it um, because the difference between the predicted observation computed in that way and the actual observation will be zero. So there will be no update being performed. So I'm not using this information twice, but I get the update for the, uh, for the Jacobian, of course, done in the right way. Then I specify my, my big function f, which is just the mapping from this five dimensional space to the three plus two n dimensional space. I compute my Jacobian, which I've done by hand, map it into the high dimensional space, and then I just write down the three lines, copy paste the three lines of the Kalman filter, and I'm doing this for all the landmarks, and then I'm done, got my update. Nothing else needs to be done for that, and I'm ready. Right? So it was actually not too complicated to actually do those individual steps. A few notes maybe about if you want to implement it on your own. Um, so if you do this measurement update in the way it was done here, you do every measurement update independently, this actually needs to require a full update of your belief at every point in time. So you may want to combine those observations and can kind of combine three observations, three sensor observations at once and execute this um, because you only you need to iterate over your n square elements only once. Um, then also one thing to take into account, um, if you haven't, you haven't Angular component there, and the Angular component is only defined from minus pi to pi, right? So you want to be careful with certain wraparounds because this will actually can screw up your Jacobians. Um, so you want to make sure that your Angular component is always uh, normalized. So that means even if you through some computation, you're put out of the minus pi to pi range, you want to normalize it so it's again back between minus pi and pi. Otherwise, this can, to, can lead to very weird behaviors, but it's something you, it's not specific to the Kalman filter. You basically have to do that um, for nearly all state estimation approaches. Um, and the other thing is these matrix um, F, you may not need to ex uh, compute this explicitly. So if you have whatever, if you use MATLAB or 
some other math libraries in Python that you're using, you can access the, the elements of your matrix directly and you would basically just fill those matrix directly. We use this matrix F because then all the expressions can be written down in very easy form on those slides so that you can see the direct relation between what's written on the slide but and, and what the core Kalman filter as we introduced it looks like. But if you implement it on your own, there may be better ways for, for just building up this huge matrix. You can actually manipulate the entrance uh, directly, which, which can be more fa can be faster because you explicitly know what is zero and don't need to touch the elements which are zero. But that's just kind of a small side note over here. And with this, we're done. We implemented our Kalman filter and we are ready to go. What I want to do now in the next couple of minutes, I want to introduce a few of the things that you see and explain you some of the concepts, what you will observe if you actually run SLAM, uh, such an EKF-based SLAM system. So the first thing, which is an important thing to note, are loop closures. So what is a loop closure? A loop closure is something which is not specific to EKF-based SLAM. It's something that is relevant in all SLAM algorithms. A loop closure is a situation where the robot drives through unknown environments for quite a while and then re-enters a known part of the environment. And this typically leads to a dramatic reduction in uncertainty because the robot can make a data association between what it sees right now with respect to a landmark that it has seen far back in the past where it potentially had a much smaller uncertainty in its estimate because while moving through this unknown space, it uncer its uncertainty increased. So by re-observing a landmark with a small uncertainty, you will reduce the uncertainty of all the landmarks you had on that way up to the point in time where you have been previously. And therefore, this is a great thing in order to reduce your uncertainty. But of course, again, this is a very prominent example. If you add a wrong loop closure, you can completely screw up your map because you're getting overly confident because you made the wrong loop closure and reduced your uncertainty dramatically, although that wasn't justified. So you have to be careful with your data association. This is a kind of key message in here. I also have an example over here. So what you see, the system started over here initially and then drove around through this environment here, 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 here and is now over here. And you can see how the uncertainty is increased because everything is specified with respect to the initial coordinate frame. So you could see very small uncertainties because it's basically just the measurement uncertainty initially and then while the mobile drives, the robot drives around and gets more uncertain. So also the uncertainty about the landmark locations gets larger and larger and larger because the robot doesn't know exactly where it is. The sensor information adds some additional uncertainty to it and so you're getting estimates of those landmarks but the kind of the, the ellipses increase. But now the key thing is the robot comes back and re-observes those landmarks, those landmarks over here we had it, had it had seen before. And now it says, okay, given I know that I had just such a small uncertainty of this landmark and now I can see it, I can reduce this uncertainty dramatically. If I reduce this uncertainty dramatically, this will actually propagate back to this one, to this one, to this one, to this one. So you can reduce the uncertainty of all those landmarks on the way until, the, until back here. And as a result of this, those will be really small and then they will be slightly larger. So those will also reduce, but these will, where you're kind of in the, in the middle on the way into the unknown space and back, they will then later on have the largest uncertainties, but still much smaller than they are right now. So if you make this update now, after the next uh, ob observation step, robot moved here, you could see all those poles are well known. Here the uncertainty is also shrunk, but they are kind of the biggest ones and then are kind of smaller over here. So this is the area with the highest uncertainty now. And that's the effect of a loop closure. And so loop closures dramatically reduce the uncertainty and therefore are key in SLAM systems. But the thing to keep in mind is that a wrong loop closure can dramatically lead to a, a wrong estimate or to what you call filter divergence, where your estimate has nothing to do with the real world anymore because you're adding an observation where you're very, very certain about, because you have this small uncertainty observation, um, and update your belief. And if this was wrong, you will, and, but you give such a high weight to this observation, but it was wrong, you will, of course, lead to um, a very, uh, you, will, you will lead to a wrong estimate because this one observation actually ruins your whole filter estimate. If you also run your filter over extended periods of time and you draw a graph, um, between the landmark locations and the robot's pose and the, the, the size of the, um, of the edges in this graph represent to the correlations that you have between the involved variables. You can see that you actually get a fully connected graph. Some of those edges are smaller like this one over here between the robot's pose and the individual landmarks but there's a larger estimate, a larger connection between those landmarks. That means in the long run the estimate 
all those estimates get fully correlated. So all the landmark locations are fully correlated with each other. So this is an effect that you can see. And you can also see is if you draw your, your state estimate and a correlation matrix, which tells you how strongly correlated different variables are with each other. And then you can actually see an interesting effect. So you would start here. This is the robot's pose. It's its first observation that is done. So the robot has some uncertainty and this landmark has some uncertainty. And this is basically the correlation matrix that you would get. So the first three dimensions refer to the XY and theta location of the robot and the rest of the blocks are basically the, um, all the landmarks. So all the landmarks have, an, have a kind of an initial uncertainty. And then while you're moving through the environment, you're getting your estimate and you're updating this. So basically all those here haven't been initialized yet and you will see the system will actually grow and initialize those matrices um, and, um, and, and therefore kind of can, can fill this matrix. So the robot actually moves around through the environment, observes all those landmarks, gets an estimate of those landmarks, and they actually get this pattern, these patterns emerging over here. And you can go further and further and further and map the environment until you kind of have a fully filled um, kind of correlation matrix here, which reveals this kind of checkerboard pattern. So we can see here we have this X and Y location over here of the platform, and then uh, this white line here is from the orientation, and then we have this checkerboard pattern over here over all landmark locations. And what you can see here, that it's a kind of a checkerboard pattern, which kind of can appear a little bit weird. Why would you get up this checkerboard pattern? But if you think about more closely about it, it actually makes sense. So it basically says, so you've been driving around, um, you, all those landmarks after you've been driving around and seeing those landmarks from different locations will always have roughly circular um, covariances. So all the individual elements over here, you say we have an uncertainty about X, an uncertainty of Y, but I have roughly a circular shaped covariance matrix for this landmark, so the two off-diagonal elements should be zero. So you basically have this as for the individual two by two blocks sitting here on the main diagonal. But all, what about all the other elements? So what, what happens, you will drive around and you have some uncertainty that, that you have in your system out about your landmark locations. And now you can say, if I would be able to fix, let's say, the X location of one landmark. So if God would tell me the X location of that landmark, then I could dramatically reduce the uncertainty about the X location of all the other landmarks as well, because basically through the estimate, I've rigidly, or not rigidly, but quite have rigidly connected those landmarks. So if I shift if I know one landmark is, gets shifted with a high uncertainty or with zero uncertainty, then all the map will shift as well. And this means if I could boil on saying, okay, this landmark, I know the precise X location of this landmark, I will know basically all X locations of all other landmarks as well. But I will not learn anything about Y. But the same happens with Y. If I would know the Y location of this landmark, I would know the Y locations of all other landmarks. And this is exactly this checkerboard pattern that you can see here. So um, you basically, by saying, by fixing one landmark, I would, uh, the X location, I would know all other landmarks. And the same holds, if you would know the X and Y location of one landmark, you could pin it down perfectly. You would basically shift the map a bit, fix it, and also dramatically reduce the uncertainty of all other landmarks. And this is basically what you can see from this checkerboard pattern. This also means that the correlations of the estimates of the, of the landmarks and also between the poles of the landmark cannot be ignored. So um, if you ignore or would ignore all those correspondence is or these uh, correlations over here, you would lead to two optic estimate of the uncertainty because your uncertainty would be too optimistic if you would because it would basically mean you're setting all the other uncertainty values to zero and this would not be the right way to go. So you, this is, you can't ignore the correlations that exist between your landmark locations. Um, another interesting thing to, to see is also the um, uncertainty of your um, landmark estimates. So how does the uncertainty about my landmark estimates develop? So what happens, what you see here is whenever the landmark occurs for the first time, it's initialized and the, then it kind of, you see how it decreases over time based on the observation. So if you have time steps over here, you basically have the uncertainty of the landmarks and you can see how the landmarks evolve. And what you can see is that it's a monotonically decreasing function which have an initial uncertainty, they get at the, initial, sorry, at the initialization. So if I start and they were close to my starting location, the uncertainty is smaller. If I'm further away, they are initialized larger because they have a larger initial uncertainty because it's the combination of the landmarks uncertainty and the robots uncertainty when observing it. But then the more you observe, those elements will go down and it's a monotonically decreasing function. And it goes down and down and down and down and down. And the key question is, will it ever get to zero? 
And um, we can say, ah, it depends. It depends basically on the initial estimate. So even if your landmark while you initialize it, you can reduce the uncertainty of those landmarks, but you will reduce the uncertainty of those landmarks never under the uncertainty of the initial uncertainty of your platform. So when the platform observed the first landmark, that's initial uncertainty. None of the landmarks uncertainty will go below this uncertainty. Right? Because just through the relative, as, as, as long as you have relative observations of those landmarks in the robot's pose. If you have some other something like you add a GPS or some other external sensor, then of course this may change. But um, if this is not the case, then you will never be able to decrease your uncertainty of a landmark below, below the initial uncertainty. Because while the robot moves, its uncertainty will increase and it can't decrease below its initial uncertainty. It's kind of the uncertainty of the of the coordinate frame that you actually gave to the system. And you will always have this initial uncertainty. You ne can never go below it unless kind of you fix your external reference frame with some external additional sensors. But as soon as you have only these relative sensors, the lower bound will be the, um, the robot's vehicle uncertainty when uh, you initialized your first landmark. You can't go be below that. Okay, um, just a few examples now. So this was one of the kind of very famous examples are called Victoria Park dataset recorded in Sydney in the Victoria Park with a vehicle driving around a laser scanner sitting here uh, in front of the vehicle and basically scanning a 2D plane in this height and basically as features the trees were used basically extracting the trunk of the trees and these generated actually features and then by driving around with this vehicle through the environment you could actually build a map of the trees in the environment. And this is an example of the trajectory. So you have the trajectory of the vehicle driving around and then the different observations that had been made on the way and the uncertainty of those observations. And you can actually build a map of the environment based on the, based on the tree locations and where the vehicle was. And so you then you have the trajectory that the vehicle has been taken and um, so the ground truth trajectory and then the estimates where the system estimated landmark locations overlaid with an aerial image. Some of them fit quite well, others are not the best possible estimates that you could get. But this was an example of this so-called Victoria Park data set, which was for years one of those standard data sets um, used in the SLAM community or in the feature-based SLAM community in order to evaluate the locations or the uh, SLAM algorithms by estimating the locations of the um, tree locations. Um, there are other data sets used for benchmarking. Uh, for example, this one over here where you um, put uh, those very well precisely defined sticks on a, a badminton court. So the uh, or tennis court, or badminton court data set, tennis court data set, um, where you actually drive around um, and, uh, and, and place those landmarks on the precisely measured locations that you use uh, for these courts and then drive around. And if you drive around, you can see the trajectory of the platform which roughly looked like this and if you perform your SLAM estimate you get the proper locations and can actually see the quartz being precisely lined out here while having mapped that. And that's kind of, kind of useful for estimating where locations are in reality because if you know the precise measurements of those quartz which are typically rather precisely done at least compared to the uh, sensor which was used in the robot which had an uncertainty of roughly let's say five centimeters in the range readings um, then you can use this as kind of a ground truth system or for in order to evaluate your um, SLAM algorithms. Okay um, a few final remarks on the um, common filter for SLAM in terms of complexity. Um, so the common filter in general you have a cubic complexity in there you have your matrices and matrix inversions involved but it's only a cubic complexity in here um, with respect to the measurement dimensionality. Um, so no, not with respect to the whole state. Um, this also depends on the fact that you're only observing a small number of landmarks. You typically never observe the whole scene at once. And then the cost step is dominated by the number of landmarks because you need to update your matrix, um, your, um, your n by n matrix, so that you have n squared elements you need to update. And this is, the cost is dominated as well as the memory consumption is dominated by that. So it's basically a quadratic complexity that all the EKF-based SLAM systems have. And if your number of landmarks get large, this can start to be a computational limitation. Um, so if you build a large map of the environment, this is something where it can, the updates can take longer and longer and longer because they grow quadratically with the number of elements that you store. Um, therefore, EKF-based SLAM is not always in place anymore today. 
especially when you build maps of larger environments. Um, but it's still quite popular if you use, for example, for visual odometry estimates, where you say, okay, I restrict myself, let's say, to 30 or 40 landmarks, and I'm just forgetting about the old landmarks. And so whenever a new landmark comes in, I forgot, forget the oldest one, it's the one which I haven't seen for the longest period of time, and this way update my estimate, um, then this is still a standard way or standard toolbox that you can actually use. But for a really large scale map, this can become computationally intractable. Okay, this brings me to the end of EKF based SLAM. So, EKF based SLAM basically means you want to estimate um, the map of the environment and the position of my landmark um, using an extended common filter. Um, so, for the linear Gaussian case, there's convergence proofs, and you can also say that, or for the linear Gaussian case, uh, the EKF based solution is actually the solution that you would get also with the least squares approach, a statistically optimal solution. Um, but again, only holds for the, uh, for the, Gaussian, for the linear case. Um, if you are living in a nonlinear world, which you are always doing in practice, then you have the problem that you're linearizing in the EKF, and the EKF only linearizes once compared to the least squares approach. So as, lo as long as you're in a nonlinear world, you're actually leaving the direct correspondency to the least squares approach, and then your performance will de decrease with the EKF because you're not relinearizing. Um, but it's still, it's a standard toolbox, especially if you're living in with Gaussian uncertainties and don't have too strong nonlinearities. It's a standard toolbox that you can actually use. It also uh, is better with smaller uncertainties. This is something that we've seen when we discussed the Kalman filter itself. Uh, the Kalman filter makes larger approximation errors if your uncertainty is larger, and then you want to kind of can keep your uncertainty as small as possible because then your linearization does a better job. Um, you may also say this is one of the reasons why there are smarter ways than initializing a landmark with infinite uncertainty. Um, one of the limitations of the EKF-based SLAM approach, but this also holds for least squares approach, is that you only have a unimodal estimate about the, where the platform is and where the landmarks are. Multimodal estimates are not possible. We say either the landmark is here or there, I don't exactly know. This is something that the EKF cannot do, which other filters, such as the particle filter, would be able to do. Um, but it's still a standard toolbox. It's kind of the first SLAM algorithm that was out there in the robotics community in order to solve the online SLAM problem. So um, it is kind of a key building block to know uh, how to perform this recursive state estimation and estimate where the vehicle is in the environment and what the map of the environment actually looks like. With this, I'm coming to the end. If you want to uh, go through that again, I recommend the probabilistic robotics book. I basically took the notation from it. Chapter 10 will tell you more about EKF-based SLAM. So with this, thank you very much for your attention, and I hope you learned this basic SLAM algorithm. I have now seen uh, simultaneous localization and mapping using the EKF, and also have an idea how that works, for example, um, and how this relates, for example, with respect to bundle adjustment or other state estimation techniques, which would use a standard least squares approach. So with this, thank you very much for your attention.